On this episode of the Houndsman XP Podcast, we've got Adam O'Donnell in the house, and he is going to talk to us about squirrel hunting with dogs. And I'm telling you, if you've never done this, it's about as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. No doubt, guys. I mean, I, I spent several years raising mountain curs, competing with, with my dogs across the United States, all the way down to South Georgia. And uh, I'll tell you, after talking to Adam, I've got a hankering to get another squirrel dog. And it's a daytime sport, and it's action-packed. When the squirrels are moving, you're going to hear some great conversation about uh, mountain curs and registries and training. I mean, it's all in here, folks. We're going to cover it all. And I had the opportunity to make some really really good friends while I was chasing these squirrel dogs and training squirrel dogs. My kids love to see my buddy Stacy Osborne come to town and he stayed in our bunkhouse and uh, Jake and Cora still talk about those days and they were just kind of on vacation that whole week that he was here and we hunted every day and and I'm telling you, it was just a, a great time, and any time that you can see the spirit of these little dogs get out there and do the job that they were bred to do, it is an absolute blast, and a lot of shooting, a lot of action, and it's good for the kids, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be able to cover this facet of our tree dog lifestyle on the Houndsman XP podcast. It's going to open some eyes for some of you who may not be exposed to this type of, of tree dog hunting, and it's going to be a good show. So stay tuned for that. I've got a question from a listener that I want to cover in this podcast. This question is from Ethan Balter, and he emailed it to me. So basically, I'll lay it out for you real quick. This guy is a... Um, former bird dog trainer and now he's got a hound approximately four weeks ago and it says my walker blue tick shows signs of working scent and he follows drags i make for him but when it comes to full-size coon he shies away from it he does only turn three months old in five days so i understand he's still young but i'm curious as to what i can do for when he gets a bit older or even now to getting more interested in coons. My first method of choice is to put him with older dogs, but where I live there isn't any, there aren't any houndsmen for about a four hour drive, which is fine in the fall and winter, but with the job I do, it makes it extremely hard to get him out this far. The guy I bought him from is willing to take me out hunting, but where he lives, I can't feasibly make that happen until October. I'm going to keep doing drags with him and my German Shepherd enjoys working the drag, so that's helping as well. But any other suggestions beyond that would be appreciated. Thanks for all the work you guys do. I wouldn't have even made it this far without you. Well, Ethan, thanks for sending us that question. And thanks for listening to the podcast, and thanks for that support. And I, I'm going to just lay out a few things that are my opinion right here. And um, just start from the top, I guess. So I would not be alarmed at three months old about uh, anything. The, the main thing that you should be doing right now is just teaching your pup to lead, teaching your pup how to be a good citizen in this world. I see way too many pups that are... Uh, are, are not given the proper attention that they need. I just laid a lot of that out on some recent videos that I did on the Houndsman XP group about socialization of pups and, and how to interact with those puppies and bring them along. You know, for instance, I've got two month old puppies here now that I'm, that I'm simply just taking on walks and, uh, the Creek is low and, um, uh, and the water is warm, so it's usually about ankle deep. Now's a great time to get them accustomed to water. You know, one of the things that I've seen over my my 
lifetime of having hounds is hounds that get hung up on water and and if you can get them accustomed to water if you can get them accustomed to obstacles um, introduce them to gunfire at feeding time all of those things are things that are in their lane right now or they're ready to start learning you can work with some hides and some different things and do some scent drags which are fine but right now i would simply i'll tell you what i do when I've got pups this age, I want them to be addicted to the scent of the game that I'm going to chase. So at three months old, it's not uncommon for me to stop and cut the tail off of a fresh roadkill. And then I take a dowel rod with a piece of string on it, probably about seven, eight foot of string, maybe, you know, so, or, and, and tie that tail to that and the other end of the dowel, dowel rod, and I'll just play with them. And let them have that fun and let them know. It's called imprinting is really what what we're talking about here. Imprinting them that when they're paying attention to that, that's their toy. That's their reward. That's, that's what we're trying to ingrain in their little minds right now. Because it's like clay. You can form it into whatever you want. But we want them to be locked in on tree game. And I do a lot of that. Don't worry about the reactions you get. Just worry about um, giving them plenty of exposure. And if your pup looks like that he's he's not having fun, keep it, keep it short, keep it simple. If they're not having fun or they lose interest, then end the game for, for the day. And make sure you're putting them in the truck and putting them in the dog box and hauling them around and things like that. Right now is the time that we, we make good citizens and – biddable hounds that we can train later um if we if we just don't pay any attention to them right now we don't expose them to anything then we're trying to do too much at one time so keep it fun keep it short keep it simple and don't worry about it if if the genetics are there they will figure it out and just introduce them to a lot of situations where nothing is new so that's my answer for you and folks we got a lot of great trainers out there that listen to this podcast so i'm going to post this question on our houndsman xp social media page it's the houndsman xp group and feel free to weigh in there <clears throat> again ethan thank you for your question thanks for your time thanks for your support of houndsman xp and if anybody else has questions and you want to discuss them, then let me know. We'll put these up on the group. We'll discuss them on the podcast. So we got a lot of fun ahead of us in this episode. Let's just get down to business, man. Let's just talk squirrel dogs. Yeah, yeah. And... So when did you start hunting squirrel dogs, Adam? 2008. What? I got my first squirrel dog from uh, Danny Hamilton out of uh, West Virginia or Virginia, and uh, he bred uh, a streak and Kemmer female to Alan Franklin's Thundersport dog, and I actually wanted a brindle, something terrible. I, I don't know what about brindle. I just like brindle, and he had a brindle male that I liked, but he wouldn't sell it, so I ended up settling for a yellow female, and uh, she made a fine dog. And, um, ended up, you know, finishing her out. Um, weird story. Uh, I bred her, drove all the way to Jamestown, Tennessee and bred her to, uh, Mountain State Apache. And Did you breed her at one of the roundup, the spring, the spring hunter, the championship or what? It was, uh, you know, I was going to go to Mark's house and, he said, uh, I'm sorry, buddy, I won't be home. And I said, oh, dang it, where are you, where are you going? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to the, the hunt at Jamestown, Tennessee. I said, well, dang, that's Don't four, save hours, me four hours for me. Would you, <laughs> would you throw the old dog in the truck and bring him with you? And he said, yeah, I guess I could do that. So he did. And we made the cross right there on the OMCBA grounds. And, um, <clears throat> I raised that litter and I had a really nice female coming along, um, out of that cross. 
and then my daughter was nas- racing the neighbor kid in my truck, unbeknownst to me, and <laughs> and literally blew the motor up in my truck. So I had to come up with some money. <laughs> yeah. And I sold the old Libby dog to fix the truck. And but I had the pup tree in, so I knew I had something to work with. So it was okay, you know. But, yeah. So uh, just kind of. A, Mark bought Apache but, from from Adam Loudon out of West Virginia. That's correct. And then there's a guy yep, over here. Back, in, there's a guy over here in Ohio named Kurt Kennedy, and uh, Kurt raised a litter of puppies that went back to Adams and Chuck Loudon's breeding. And I've got the papers around somewhere, but, but, uh, huh. that was my sassy dog and she was brindle and white. So they, they, what? Kurt crossed that pup or that his female, I think he bred her to, um, one Alan Franklin's dog. So I think, I don't think it's sport though. I can't remember. I've, it's been a few years ago. So yeah, I'm I'm real familiar mm-hmm. with that that bloodline. I'm real familiar with Apache. I've hunted with him at least once, maybe maybe more than once. Uh, sure. Well, yeah. Chris, do you recall uh, you had planned on breeding Sassy, or maybe you tried, and I actually booked a pup from you. Uh, you were going to breed her, if I'm not mistaken, to uh, Osborne's Jackhammer. Yep. Yep. And I I don't think she took or something she, happened she there did. where I, I didn't end up getting one. I'll tell I'll tell you what happened on that was um she was bred and I think this is the litter that she was bred on and no, I'm sorry, this was a different litter. <clears throat> Osborne's jackhammer she didn't take. And then Okay. Um I ended up breeding her to a treeing cur here local after that, who was a really nice dog, a uh, super coon mm-hmm. dog. He was, uh, he was out of a, uh, the stylish fly dog and a mountain cur female. And while she was pregnant with that litter, she had a false pregnancy or actually she aborted the litter, but didn't mm-hmm. pass it. She became septic and it ended up, ended up killing her. Oh, yep. that's too bad. I remember yep. you coon hunted her a lot. And, yeah, she uh, had money on highly PKC. of her. Yep. I remember you telling me you would hunt her against anything, that she was going to get it done. Uh, she was just a go-get-tree type of dog. And I think that was one of the reasons I ended up settling for a yellow cur because our deal fell through. And then I couldn't get Danny to sell me the mail, and I was just so desperate to get a cur that I ended up with Libby. Now, I don't regret that today because she ended up being a tremendous reproducer. Yeah. Um, But the weird thing was uh, I had raised that other pup out of her in Apache, and she was a pleasure dog. Uh, She was a she hated a coon, something terrible. And she would tree sometimes more daytime coon than she would squirrel. So that really took her out of the realm of competition, which was fine. I wasn't into competition then. But uh, long story short, I tried to breed her years later to tree knock and ammo which was a world night champion down in Tennessee. And I found out that my buddy Al Inglesman here in Michigan had Ammo's brother. And I thought, well, that's stupid for me to go all the way to Tennessee to breed to Ammo when I can go a couple hours west side of the state to breed to his brother. You're right. And so that's what we tried to do. Well, I pull in his driveway and I just was taken back. I'm looking at this yellow cur female. I'm like, Oh my God, that that's Libby. (laughs) Right. My old dog. (laughs) So I get out of the truck and he's chuckling because he knows me and he knows that I'm going to recognize her. And I said, that's my old dog. He says, I know it. (laughs) He said, I bought her, uh, Oh, I don't know. 
eight, nine months ago and didn't tell nobody. I was just planning on showing up to a hunt someday and, and, uh, beating everybody with her cause she was that good. And anyway, she, he had bred her to the old bobtail Fred dog, which was toots Dale and toots candy. Yep. And that's what Adam Loudon stuff went. Adam, Adam's Adam yes. Loudon stuff went that's, back to that heavy. A lot of it did, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mountain State Holly that they bred to Apache, um, she was right out of that. She would have been a litter mate to Fred. But anyway, I fell in love immediately with the little brindle male that he had out of Fred and Libby. But he had planned to keep it, and he wouldn't sell it. Um, so I left the old lady dog there. And when I went back after he got her bread, I went back to pick her up. I talked him into letting me take that pup. And I said, just, just go halves with me. I'll raise him. I'll do all the work. I'll hunt the fire out of him, but I got to have that pup. And he was also keeping a female and he said, well, I guess that would be all right. So I ended up bringing porcupine mountain bud home and it turns out that the male I bred to, the tree knocking Cyrus, uh, Al didn't know it and nobody knew it at the time. He was sterile. So hmm. I didn't get no puppies. And I had um, paid him a stud fee. And of course, out of sight, out of mind, I had had the pup for two months by the time we realized she wasn't bred. And he just said, you know what, rather than me give you the stud fee back, why don't you just keep the pup? I'll send you the papers. I was fine with that deal because I really liked him. Yeah. So that's how I ended up with Porcupine Mountain Bud, which was out of my original old Libby dog. Well, let's get into that. So, but let's pick up the story there in a couple minutes here. But tell it, tell our audience where you're from, Adam, and, and – uh, Kind of what your background is with with dogs and sure and things like that. So uh, born and go ahead. Born and raised here in Michigan, and uh, my history is coon dogs. Man, I I had coon dogs for years. I I got my very first coon dog when I was uh, fourteen years old uh, from my friend Larry Atherton, and uh, that's a name. From I'm the one past. of those. What's that? I said I recognize that name. That's a that's a blast from the past, right there. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's still around. Yep. Uh, still hunts the same line. And what kind but of dog he was had he? The old Hickory Hill. You remember Oliver Close had Hickory Hill Jack and Little Jack. And yeah, what? Tell our listeners what breed that would have been, Adam. Uh, tree and Walkers. Yep. So I got my first tree and walker pup from him when I was 14 years old, and I went coon crazy. I uh, felt like Billy Coleman on Where the Red Fern Grows. You know, I didn't have a truck. I had a mag light and a 22, and we hunted We hunted all the time <laughs> and uh, just couldn't get enough of it, you know. And um, my family moved up north when I was uh, right out of uh, a freshman in high school, that dog that I had ended up getting killed in the road. And so I fiddled around with different lines of dogs, different breeds. Um, and it just turned out that I ended up in the back, uh, the, the back neighborhood or the backyard basically of Zeke Voracek, a big cur dog, man. Mm -hmm. And, um, Zeke introduced me to squirrel hunting with curs, and man, he had some good ones, but uh, they were, <laughs> they'd bite you. <laughs> yeah. You, you didn't want to reach in the dog box and pull one out if they didn't know you. You know, you'd pull out a nub. Uh, so I kind of got my feet wet uh, as a young man with the cur dogs with him, and uh, and I actually trained a few hounds on squirrels and and they were very uh efficient you know Mm -hmm. enjoyed myself that's what we did but um i went through the uh, competition season of my life with the hounds Uh, 
at one point I had a Grand Knight Champion Walker Mail out of Sackett. Well, no, it would be out of Tell Sackett and uh, my old threat female. And he got shot and killed by a landowner. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard it happen. I ended up suing the guy. I, I, you know, we settled out of court and all that. But through that process, I ended up with a plot hound female. My oh, buddy no. Ray Stein. Yeah, I know Ray. Been, uh, yeah, Ray Stein brought me five hundred dollars the day after that guy shot my dog to retain a lawyer. That's amazing. Okay. Yes. He brought $500 to my house and said, here, you need to get a good lawyer. And, you know, so anyway, uh, after the pain of it all settled down and I've got a lawyer, Ray called me up one day and said, Hey, I just bought a really nice little young female off of John walk up. And she was out of Buckeye bud and her name was Buckeye Annie. And he said, why don't you take her and just hunt her for a month and we'll forget about that $500. So I said, that sounds like a, a deal. Cause I, I, I was kind of ready to hunt a little bit. Uh, the hurt feelings of getting my dog killed was, was sort of behind me. And so I did, I, I hunted her and I hunted her hard. And at the end of that month, I called Ray and I said, dude, do you realize what you have here? This little jip can win. <laughs> <laughs> she is a split tree and accurate machine. So he says, I'll tell you what, why don't you, uh, plan on putting her a little, little, just a few local hunts and you promote her and I'll give half interest of her to you. So I did. <laughs> And, uh, the little Annie dog went from nothing to grand night champion in eight hunts. I think she had uh, three first place registered wins and three, uh, first place night champion wins right in a row. Just bam, bam, bam. Yep. And, uh, far as I know, Chris, to this day, her PKC money is still the all time money winning plot hound female i think she still holds the record so um, she was definitely making a splash I, adam i mean everybody yes, everybody was, was hearing uh, that name yep she was one of the dogs that uh people would say i can't believe i got beat by a plot you know <laughs> and when we get back <laughs> to curs you know, I'll country, when we get back to curs i will tell you a story about hearing the same thing about getting beat by a mountain cur in PKC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's sort of my history. When, uh, when Ray Stein died, uh, it upset my apple cart and it ruined it for me. I did not want, um, I just didn't want to coon hunt anymore. He was my best friend. Um, it, it's, it put me in a bad place. And so to be honest with you, it was probably good timing because I was hitting it hard, buddy, and it was it was about to cost me a marriage. So I I give up the hounds, and it was just a the, a timely exit, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And and I went from from being obsessed with tree dogs to nothing, and it left a huge void. So I picked up a couple nice bred beagles and I tried the beagles and the field trials. And I went with, uh, just trying to get a beagle to do something to, to have to run the, with the kids and whatnot to having a yard full of them and going to field trials every weekend. And that wasn't working either. It just, <laughs> it just was you know, like, I couldn't, you couldn't, know, uh, I'm, couldn't get away from the tree dogs. I'm, I'm getting, I write an article for Southern Hound, and maybe I'm spoiling a little bit, but my next article is going to be about uh, taking care of things at home before. Yes, you know. So I'm. That's that's where I'll. That's a whole conversation that maybe you and I can have on a different podcast. But I'll just. 
sum it up by saying that that as I get older and you know my kids are grown, I've come to the realization that I enjoy my time in the field much more when I have that peace of mind that I've taken care of stuff at home first. Yeah. Boy, isn't that the truth? And on my end, uh, I was on a second marriage, as it were, and I ended up with custody of my two boys. And my wife was raising our children basically by herself. And it wasn't fair. It wasn't right. And, and I know there's a lot of hounds, guys, that are spoiled with good women. I'm one and of them. And there's a few that fight with their woman, and they, they fight to be able to go, and they fight to be able to get to the hunts, and it's just no fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're right, man. we got to take care of family first. Yeah. And everything else falls into place. Yeah. We'll, we'll get into Adam, you'd be a perfect guy for me to have this discussion with on a future podcast. So, and we can we can share good, stories like of plan. yeah stories of misery and and realization and maturity and growing up and figuring out that you know some things just aren't worth it. But uh, so we we fast forward past Buckeye Annie, big splice there. That sounds like another podcast we could have. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's get into these squirrel dogs and let's talk about, I, I guess, the place to start with, with squirrel dogs and curs, because you and I have both followed similar paths with Original Mountain Curs and the Original Mountain Cur Breeder Association and having those types of registered dogs. But, uh, you know, sure. I, I think I think one of the things that, if we're going to start at the beginning, how these dogs all came about is if you read the old historical journals from colonial America and, you know, we're talking 1750s to this, you know, through 1810 or so, there's several accounts written in there about dogs around the homesteads and and on the frontier. So these dogs all came over and they were of mixed descent and, And these hunters would take them into the frontier with them for a variety of reasons. They would take them into the mountains of, of, uh, in Virginia and Kentucky and North Carolina, the Appalachians were the frontier in colonial times. And, and the people would come from the settlements and they would take dogs with them. They'd take them with them to catch game for security at night for different things like that. And so they were a huge part of our culture. And then when the settlers came over their mountains and, and Boone opened up the frontier to settlement in Kentucky, there's several accounts of these dogs on the frontier, and they were homestead dogs. They would herd the cattle at day during the day, put, on, put the food on the table, uh, you know, guard the homestead. And this whole cur dog ancestry just grew from there. Yes. Well, if you look back you'll find uh, pictures I mean you'll see great pictures of the original 300 as it were uh, OMCBA dogs that when they closed that registry there are some really neat old photos Ledbetter and and uh, you know a lot of them guys had these cur dogs and and they were they were dogs that laid on the front porch and kept the foxes out of the chickens, and they'd go out at night and treat possums and coons and, and squirrels during the day and whatever else would probably climb. But they were family dogs that they would. they protect the family. And um, what a great history. Uh, and, you know, there's the registry that was uh, established to protect that breed. Mm-hmm. And I get very um, ruffled, if you will, when I hear this talk about, well, they're just mutts. Well, yeah, they did originate from mutts, but the registry has been in existence for 65 years. Right. Any idea how many generations that is? And dog, and, <laughs> you know, those original dogs don't even show up on a five-generation pedigree anymore. Right, right. 
and, and gone. We'll get into the registry stuff. You know, the thing, the thing that is amazing to me, it's how our culture has changed. So you get these people that are settling the frontier in Kentucky in 17, the 1760s. Yeah. There are still, think about everything that's going on then. You've got the British in this country. Uh, we haven't won our independence from England yet. Um, and then as the Revolutionary War kicks off, so, th- so they were the, these frontier and homesteaders and settlers were on the lookout for the Shawnee. And so they would be out with mm-hmm. their dogs clearing a field or whatever. They had a rifle with them. Their dog would tree a squirrel or a coon off in the woods from where they were treeing or bay a bear. And they would go out there. They weren't going to pass up the opportunity for to put food in the pot that sure. night. So from there, we've grown into what is now, you know, a, a dog that's that's uh, a, a hunting type, hunting breed of dogs. Yeah. Which takes there's us a, back to what you were talking a, about 65 years ago. So give us that history yes. on the original. And, and I need to qualify this. You're a director you're on the board of directors for the original Mountain Curve Breeder Association. Yes, I I was voted in a couple of years ago, and and uh, I I I am a huge fan of the OMCBA. I always have been. I've uh, it, it's been my my go to registry for years. Um, now the the breed. I appreciate the breed, and 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 honestly, Chris, you or I probably wouldn't care to hunt with one of those original cur dogs because they don't they don't um, hunt the way we like to hunt today from a tailgate or whatever. I mean, those were family dogs, and they were um, as much of a cattle dog and a protecting the chickens as they were go catch dinner type dog. Right. And, uh, there's only one guy I know, and I know there's some guys in the country, but there's a uh, Randy Garner in Ohio has, has often referred to those original dogs. And he said, it's getting harder to find those types of dogs as the breed morphs into, um, harder going, harder tree dogs, more competition oriented. Um, and there's a few people in the country that, that, that have tried to cling to some of those well, let dogs me, that lay on the porch and bark when the neighbor shows up, you know? Yeah. Let me tell you how I, so, I how I got into OMCBA. I, my, our paths are so similar. And, and when I got to know you years ago, it was like parallel paths and kindred spirit type stuff here. But the reason I got into original mountain curves was because of historical, uh, the historical aspect of it, you know, and I, I was doing some living history type stuff and, and different things like that. And so I was reading a lot of journals from colonial America and that type of dog, a dog that you take off the tailgate and unsnap and it goes 500 yards and trees a squirrel was of no use to that's right the the frontiersman the long hunter that was coming over the mountains and hunting in this area they depended on that dog for all sorts of things and it was it was from like you said protecting the chickens to and i i always look at it like this it's like kids with a dog today we had a little cur is actually a little mountain feist that was here and if they were outside, she was outside. And if they were swimming in the creek, she was on the bank above them and she was catching snakes and she would bay possums and she would, yep. you know, it, it was her job. It was like as hardwired to her and job. It gave, yeah. And it gave you a sense of comfort to have that dog with your children. Yep. Yep. If they were in the goat pen, you know. that little dog was with them. And if that one of those goat, one of those nanny goats would try to try to buffalo those girls of mine. I mean, Squirt was right there with them. You know, she was right in the middle of it. I've I seen her see grit. it in my mind's eye. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that is that was the purpose of that dog. Their idea, what our idea is now, uh, you know, unsnapping them, pulling them off a tree. Man, that, that wasn't even in their, not even close to being no. in their mindset. 
No. Who wants to walk a thousand yards up a mountain and down the other side to the next hill to go kill a squirrel? I mean, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Not to mention what's you know. between you and the, the dog treat a thousand yards away. You know, your security <laughs> yeah. just yeah. left you. So, yeah, yeah. So, so tell us about you've you've come we've talked about that part now tell us tell us about the modern day mountain cur because you've done a you've done a lot of competing with mountain curs over the years and that's why you you know really what you got into tell us how yeah show us that morph that that you're talking about from what was traditional to what is today and i do kind of want to go back and talk about the historical breeding of the dogs uh, back to that, how we got there, but but let's hear the how they've changed in your opinion. Well, like I, I referred to the photos, and you can go to Jamestown, Tennessee, to the clubhouse, and you can look at some of them uh, original pictures on the wall uh, that uh, look like <laughs> you know these cur dogs that were. Some of them look part shepherd and part. Part of this, part of that. They were much, you know. I think very they, unimpressive. They bred to the neighbor's dog that did the same thing that had the qualities that they wanted. And and uh, there's a vast uh, variety of gene pool there in them original cur dogs. And so when we look at dogs today, uh, you you can see some of that there. But I. I'll be um, the first one to tell you that there's been some outside influence added to the breed for various different reasons. Here we go. And uh, while I'm, <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a, a fan of that, uh, I'm, I'm actually dead set against it today as it stands. But I will not stand here and tell you that it wasn't a necessary evil. The problem I have with the influence of outside blood is that it's false. It's not true. And if I were to uh, look at different dogs today, I can see a strong influence of falsehoods. You know, walker dogs, plot dogs, uh, bird dogs, different things that people thought they needed to add to get a, an edge on what they want the breed to morph into. The dog that you flip from the tailgate that goes 600 yards in three seconds and gets treated under a squirrel. Those are the dogs that are winning the hunts. But that's not what the frontiersmen started out with. Well, that's the hypocrisy. Nor did, of, they, nor did they want it. Yeah, the hypocrisy is the thing that I had a hard time dealing with, and th this isn't going to be an o, uh, you know a, an OMCBA bashing session by any means. But no, but it, we're going to talk about. I, the, I'm not here we're, to. We're going to talk about the truth on this podcast. Uh, we do on well, every we other podcast, and I w yeah. we can't have it any other way. But I used to joke around with guys and. Uh, I just tell them I'd say, you know, my plot has more original mountain cur than your registered original mountain cur does, <laughs> and, and isn't that probably true? <laughs> you know, yeah. And, well, and, and 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 there's another breed that's got some uh, shady business in the background because they were originally called plot curs. You know, uh, when you had, when you look at the culture of those people, Adam, I mean. What's the farthest you, you've ever heard of somebody driving to breed to a stud dog in modern times? You know, 10, 11, 12? Um, yes. Hours? Uh, 12 hours. Yes. I Well, I've done it. Yeah. I drove 12 hours to Grundy, Virginia to try to breed to a 2020 tank and didn't get any puppies. So, uh, in... But, in the early, it night, happens. you know, late eight, all through the 1800s, people didn't have that transportation until that no. style of transportation until the interstate system was developed. So, you know, when you're living on a mountain and you need, you, your dog probably wasn't even tied up. So it probably the neighbor's dog came over and bred it anyway. You probably had no control yeah. over there, but there were some dedicated breeders in those days 
and and they looked at what was a day's wagon ride from their house more than likely or a day's mule ride from their house and so it became very localized right. so what we're seeing today is is totally unheard of from you know or incomprehensible by their standards of what we're doing and how far we're traveling for one thing they didn't even know about the dog that was 10 hours away and now we've right. got social media and internet and all kinds of stuff we can find them well in just the last 10 years things have changed drastically for the exact reasons you're talking about the internet has been a tool for some breeders to promote their dogs as well as show off their winnings and and attend more hunts which produces bigger wins and more wins and the notoriety gets stronger and then you start bringing in some outside females from farther distances Mm -hmm. because that's the flavor of the month right and it happens that way in all breeds yep and uh facebook has been a big game changer for a lot of areas in in all our everyday lives, even though we're not even aware of it, you know. Um, but you're right. There's uh, the whole idea of selective breeding. Um, it's it's kind of foreign to the to the old timers that that didn't have the ability to pick and choose so much like we do today. So I. I um, I, I sort of wouldn't want to live back then for that you know, reason. You know, I mean, the, I had this conversation okay. with my wife the other day. We're sitting there and we're talking about everybody always talks about the good old days. And let's, I can tell you right now that there probably aren't very many people, <laughs> myself included, that could live in the good old days. You know, we're not tough no. enough anymore and we like our conveniences and we like all those st- things. But that's what animal husbandry is all about <laughs> is, is yeah. moving forward you know, and, and keeping that going. And, and I started to talk about it a second ago, but, but that was kind of the nail in the coffin for me with, I don't have a problem if there were means to register a tree and cur that was not original mountain cur bloodlines, but the OMCBA books were closed. How long ago? 30 years? 65 years ago. Six. There you go, 65, 65. years ago. They well, closed. longer than that now. I think 66 or 67, but yeah, long enough to have established a breed several times over. Yeah. So the, yeah. the problem I had was sneaking stuff in and, and for the sake of yeah. of winning a hunt or selling more puppies or you know things like that. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it. I don't care. Go for it, man. If you're better, and yeah. but don't try to say they came well, over on the Mayflower and what you have in your yard is pure. Absolutely, yeah. And, and honestly, the 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 flip side of that whole coin, and probably a lot of our listeners don't understand that the OMCBA and what we've gone through, but um, it was put to a membership vote here a few years back to incorporate DNA testing on breeding pairs so that we could stop some of the false papering and and, uh, false registering of dogs that are bred to a hound somewhere or a bird dog, you know. Mm -hmm. And the members as a whole uh, voted that thing down. Now, my personal opinion is it was sabotaged from the start because of the verbiage that was put in the ballot. Exactly. Uh, I don't personally think that the. Uh, I wish I still had a copy of that ballot. The so higher I could up, read if it. you will, wanted it to pass. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, that happened before I was on the board, and I'm not saying it would have changed. It wouldn't have. Um, but I am a, I am a staunch advocate for DNA. And I think that in the minds of the OMCBA members as a whole, they think that DNA will reflect or show what they've been adding. <laughs> <laughs> no. As if to say, we've got 50% hound and 25% bird dog and 25% original mountain cur. That's not how this works. 
Uh, <laughs> anybody that's been in the coonhound circuit knows what DNA is. It's nothing but, but, but um, genetic markers. Right. And you get those genetic markers in number form, and when you DNA a puppy, th- those numbers have to line up or match with the parents to a certain percentage. And if they don't, then we can rule out that that pup is out of who you say it's out of. All right? And it's not that costly. No. But PKC I think and U- they, they, PKC and UKC have been doing it for 20, yes. years, 20 years now, probably. Absolutely. And you know how, how many dogs yep. I've had that are DNA profiles? I have never, ever... I get that. I used to get that certificate back with all the color charts on it. And yep. the, I never studied that. It was just like, yeah, that one, that one passed. You know, I'm not a geneticist type. I wasn't worried about it. So right. thinking that, that we can take a DNA analysis and analyze it to the point where we can show, oh, you know, this isn't 23 and me or whatever that, whatever that genetic thing is where we get a report back says, oh, you're like 1% African, whatever, you know, a thousand years ago. It's yeah. not, it's not like that. Yeah. You're 15% Irish and yeah. yeah, that's not it. It doesn't, it, that's not the DNA test that we want. Yeah. We yeah. only want to verify parentage. Right. And that's all it does. This puppy is from that and, male and that female that you put on yep. their papers. And there you go. Congratulations. And their DNA matches. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That, that was a, that was a sad day for me when that failed. And I, I personally believe that the floodgates have opened with the membership as to say, well, they don't care. So let's do what we want anyway. No one's going to ever do anything about it. We are seeing more dogs show up on the scene that that just don't look. Um, I, I mean, I have a real problem when I look at a cur dog and it's got nine inch long ears and feet the size of grapefruit. You know, <laughs> you can't find anything like that in the in the uh, <laughs> in the original three hundred. So so there's a rat in the wood pile. You know, and I don't care what color he is. I see these guys blowing up because somebody's got a tricolored cur. Well, whip de doo I can find a tricolored cur in the original 300, but I can't find one that's got nine-inch long ears. Exactly. You know. So, and here's another thing. I know dogs that are only a quarter hound with OMCBA papers. But they are a, a serious throwback, genetically speaking, to the hound. In other words, they're three-quarter cur, but they got this big ball mouth and these big long ears and this big bone structure, and they move like a hound. And they're not original mountain curs, although they have the papers. And it's very troubling to me, and I think that we've dropped the ball on trying to stop some of this. I th- <laughs> it's I like a pan it's like years. a Pandora's box, Adam. You know, that box is open and 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 so here we go and and part of it is when you're a person that I I don't know. That's why I went back to just hunting my hounds. You know, just hunting my hounds, hunting the way I want to and and things like that. I thought, man, I don't need to pay that money to a me- to to a- belong to a club that can't stand on its principles and be yeah. honest in what's going on and and it's unfortunate. It is troubling. And the thing that the thing yep. that I'll say is I have made some wonderful friendships through the OMCBA and I'll always be grateful for that. I've probably never attended any events that I've enjoyed as much in my lifetime. And I've traveled all over the country going to different events as I've enjoyed going to Jamestown, Tennessee and, uh, you know, listening to the music that's being played and the gathering and the rendezvous, you know, you got the mentors from Southern Mississippi and Stacy Osborne and, and, you know, the list goes on and on of people that, that I just thoroughly enjoyed, you know, David Snyder and I traveled several years together down there and camped and 
and it was it was awesome. So part of it is, yeah. Instead of me just saying, "Okay, it is what it is," and you know, at the time that I was doing it, I wanted to be competitive, but I wanted to do it right. And so yeah. it became a huge hurdle when you would get down there and you're thinking, "Okay, I'm going to do things right. I'm going to do things, but I want to be competitive." And then you get beat by something that's got nine inch ears. Yeah. Well, Chris, I can tell you, um, last year I hunted competition hunted in eight States. Two years ago, I hunted nine States and the OMCBA crowd is the salt of the earth. My kind of people by far. And I believe that there's a, old school mentality there that I haven't been able to grasp in that somehow they're just mutts. So it doesn't matter if we keep them mutts. Mm -hmm. And I think that's unfortunate. I'm not mad at anybody. I don't dislike anybody for, for adding what they deem to, to add, but I, I can't go along with it. And I can't condone it, and I want it to stop because the breed today has enough genetic diversity to do whatever you want to do. I agree. That was if, always my. If you want, uh, if you want a dog to guard the chickens and sit on the front porch, I believe you can still find one. And if you want a dog to bust in there 900 yards and get set, parked under a squirrel in three seconds, you can find one of them too. That's fast. But if we don't stop the, the, the continuation of adding whatever Joe Blow feels like adding, we're going we're gonna to lose the breed. And we're close to it now. I believe that, and I wasn't aware of the dangers of that or seen it firsthand until I became a board member and started paying attention. And that's very unfortunate. Well, there's, um, cer there's I, certain great... I don't want to... Go ahead. Finish your thought there, Adam. I was just going to say, I, I don't want to say that I worship the OMCBA, but I thought so highly of it. <laughs> and then the more I got involved in the the more horror stories you hear and the more false looking dogs you see popping up, it really knocks the wind out of you yeah. as a breeder. Well, the thing, the thing about, um, you know, cur dogs is that's what they are. They're cur dogs or they're, they're, they're talented dogs of mixed heritage that serve a purpose. And I mean, that's the definition of a cur dog. And the, even, even the, uh, you ask a person on the street that isn't familiar with OMCBA or national current vice breeder association or, you know, camera or whatever, you know, that if you say cur to somebody, it's going to be like, that's a dog of mixed, mixed lineage, you know? Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and it's such a wonderful, it can be such a wonderful type of dog to have i mean it's just uh it's pleasurable and and you mentioned earlier maybe not the type of dog that you and i would like well i can tell you that i've kind of shifted back into that uh, i'm telling you man i love just taking a dog out for a walk and like i've got a pit bull terrier here now and that dude will i'll turn around mm -hmm, and bang mm -hmm. he'll be underneath a root wad and it's like what you got you know and kind of the terrier type work stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty yeah. fun, you know, and, and having plots. That, yeah. Like when we hunt out West, when we bear hunt out West or whatever, you don't need dogs that are 600 yards away from you because there's wolves. So I've got all my plots trained where, you know, they hunt with me and they stay pretty close. So I've kind of shifted back and got out of that competition scene, uh, is, mm -hmm. is my main focus anymore. So, I, I still cling to that sort of stuff, and and it's a, it's a rich heritage. So tell so tell me what um, you know. Tell me what you're looking for in a squirrel dog that that sets it apart for you, and sure. and what people should be looking for. Uh well, there's sort of a 
a broad spectrum there, Chris, because you've got guys that pleasure hunt that don't want nothing to do with competition hunt. Okay. And those guys are looking for the dog that's going to stay within a two, two to 250 yard circle and sweep through the woods and find every squirrel that they cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not necessarily me. I am a guy that's going to go to a hunt on Saturday. So I can take that young dog. That's, uh, that type of a hunter and I can train them the way I want them to hunt. And I'm a tailgate hunter. Um, I want a dog to bust in hard fast and uh i don't want one to straight line so to speak but i do want one to cut the woods up in in a hurry um i train dogs to go and to go hard and to go fast and i do that when they're puppies i just walk them through the woods expose them get them out there when they when they tree a squirrel i shoot it out to them um but as they as they grow um I'll start drop hunting and what I'll do is I'll pull almost up to the woods and I'll send that pup out there. And if they come back, put them in the box and then I'll turn an old dog loose. And suddenly they realize they're not having any fun in the box. (laughs) That's interesting. So what they learn to do is to go and not come back, Mm -hmm. you know, and I'll back of the truck up down an old farm lane over the course of a month and I'll get to where I can turn that dog loose a half a mile from the woods and he'll go to it. Now that kind of thinking is foreign to a lot of squirrel hunters. Okay. I get that. But if you take a dog that will bust in there on a dead run and go find a squirrel, um, that far, then when you put them in squirrels, they don't need to necessarily need to go that far, but they will. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. I don't want a dog that's going to run out there 200 yards and come back and stand there looking at me like I couldn't find anything. Okay. That's a pleasure dog. That means, okay, let's walk up a little farther and I'll just, you just tag along and you sweep around in front of me and eventually we'll find one. I've had people tell me when my dog got in there 650 yards, say, tree and say i wouldn't own a dog that would go that far okay well he's sitting under there sitting in there with a squirrel and your dog's running around us not even getting out of sight and what i found was we walk their dog to my dog and they don't tree any squirrels (laughs) so my dog went as far as he had to go to tree a squirrel and it's not like he's missing squirrels and I don't want him to miss squirrels, but I want him to go till he finds one. And that's a competition dog. Yeah. I, and I, re- I pleasure hunt all week long. I, I think one of the things to make that, that kind of dog. Yeah. I think one of the things that you and I have been plugged with, Adam, is the fact that we came from a competition coon hunting background when we got into this. And. Agreed. I, 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 it was almost a curse because we knew <laughs> we knew what dogs were capable of. So you would go to a hunt and you'd draw it with two other dogs, three dog casts in a competition squirrel hunt, and you would get the guy or two guys in the cast that would be like, well, do you mind if we walk our dogs? And And my response was, I didn't come out here to walk my dog. I came out here to walk the trees and... I've got this dog tuned to where I cut them loose. They're going to go find a squirrel. If they need me to walk to them, they're not a squirrel dog. And so you had the old thinking mixing with the new thinking. And I'm not saying that I was right because honestly, I think that, that I was a little too hard lined on the whole thing. And if I had it to do over again, I'd probably enjoy the dog that, that kind of hung around and, and walked with me through the woods and things like that. But we knew what a dog was capable of. And I did the exact same thing. You know, you start out where you start out there at the woods and you back it up every time before you know it, man, that dog is busting in there. There are dogs that will 
uh, make a big loop and come back. And if they don't hit nothing, they're not going any further. Um, and, and there's dogs that know that the squirrels aren't moving that day and they won't hunt very well. Um, I can't have that, that type of dog. We like to I'm win. We like to win too much. Well, <laughs> besides that, you're right. You're right. I go anywhere I go. I, I, I hope to win. That's right. Um, but, I'm not going to South Carolina or Georgia or Tennessee or Mississippi to not know what I'm pulling out of my dog box. I need consistency. And, um, cur dogs are quirky. They, they, are. they can be real funny. Uh, I can't have the quirky. I, I work hard to not, um, breed any of that into my, my, my dogs. Uh, I don't put up with it if I see it. I've seen dogs that, man, if, if another dog uh, bumped into them at the release, they turn around and come back and stand there. They won't hunt, and I can't have that, you know. Um, so you got to be careful what you get, and there are um, a lot of great squirrel dogs out there, Chris. There's feists, lakeas, elk hounds, mountain curs tree and curs i've even had some really good uh hounds that would would uh, consistently tree coons and squirrels in the mm-hmm. day but um i, I think enjoy we, I think what we, i'm doing and i think we put limits on them you know i i we put limits on our dogs to try to try to get them and obviously you can do that with the mountain cur uh you can break them off of coons you can break them off but they're a versatile dog that you can use for anything, really. I've some of the. I'll tell you what. This is a kind of a cool story, but back in the day when uh, there was an association that was still using live bear and hogs at live bays, and uh, the dogs that performed. The I mean, the whole crowd was just like, "Wow!" It was a bunch of washout <laughs> squirrel dogs that were all original mountain <laughs> curs. And I mean, they flat wore that hog out in that bay pen and that's been 25 years ago, but it was amazing to see that. Um, so I think our listeners really, cause we got, we've got listeners all across the world. So lay out a competition squirrel, squirrel hunt for people and, and just talk to us briefly about, uh, what that is and how score is kept and, and maybe we can sure. tie some pieces together here of why we need a dog in a competition that would be different than just a hunting dog, you know, just a cool dog to have around. That's going to yeah. be your buddy and going down the trail. Well, first let me mention too, and I've already kind of mentioned it, but I can take a pleasure dog and, and manipulate it into somewhat of a competition dog. So if, you know, it's just like, Oh, well, this dog's a, uh, world champion and this dog's a world champion and I'm going to get a pup and I'm going to get some, um, big rangy dog that I can't keep up with. That's not necessarily true. We, we, we train them sometimes to be that way. Mm -hmm. And these cur dogs are so smart, but a competition dog is nothing more than a pleasure dog. That's, that's been road hard to do what he's supposed to do and not get away with any deviation from that okay so a competition hunt whether it be ukc nkc uh nsd you know there's there's a variety of formats and they're all relevantly close um some of them are more forgiving than others but let's just say nsd which is my personal favorite format uh we'll take that for an example you go to a hunt um, let's say there's nine dogs that show up. Okay. You're going to draw out in what's called a cast with two other dogs. So there's going to be three casts of three dogs. All right. So those three dogs are going to have a designated guide and someone in the cast is going to be a designated judge that, that, and, and, and it's all of our responsibility to know the rules. So when you go out there, you're going to hunt for 90 minutes. Every cast is 90 minutes. Some some hunts 
Uh, other formats are two hours, but we're just going to use NSD as an example. Okay. And uh, you'll hunt for 90 minutes, and you're going to you're going to cast the dogs off, and the judge is going to start the the countdown clock. All right. <clears throat> so basically, uh, the dogs are released, and they've got to go find a squirrel. Whether you follow them along behind and move along with them or you just stand there and, and walk to the first dog tree, whatever the case may be, that's up to the cast. But uh, the dog that trees first is declared treed by its owner, and you go in. he's got to stay treed for two minutes before he can be handled. You go into that tree. If other dogs are treed, um, before that tree is closed, they can be treed um, at that tree for less points, or they can be treed split off to themselves. Um, a tree is worth 100 points. Mm -hmm. Second tree is worth 40. And third tree is, uh, I think, 25 or 20. But um, you, go, you go in there, and you've got to handle your dog, and then you've got five minutes to show that uh, cast the squirrel. Um, you got to find the squirrel and you got to show it to everybody or, or the majority of the cast has to see the squirrel in order for the tree to be plussed. So if you, if you've got the squirrel, that's a hundred plus. Yep. Um, in a nutshell, the dog that trees the most squirrels or has the most plus points at the end of the 90 minutes is the winner. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of um, finite rules that you would need to know to, to compete. In other words, there's a leash lock rule. There's a, a continuous barking rule. There's a lot of rules that, you know, we probably don't need to discuss today. But Yeah, those are the in the advanced classes. Is. Well, every <laughs> cast is, is played by the same rules, and it, it would – it would uh, behoove someone to know the rules, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, a right. dog just can't run out there and bark and bark and bark and bark. And, you know, they've only got like three minutes <laughs> and they got to be treated or they're going to take some minus points. Um, so you don't want a dog that's mouthy on the ground, uh, unless he's quick about it. I've seen dogs that barked a few times and when you heard them open, they were getting ready to tree and that's fine. I could tell you about a little cur dog I had. She never met a tree she didn't like. <laughs> Holy moly. Sn David Snyder could talk me into Yeah, never mind. Yeah, she she was a <laughs> uh, she was a tree dog. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I've had a I've had a few tree dogs. <laughs> Man. Oh wow. You know, that's a, that's a misconception. Huh? I believe wholeheartedly that uh, the original 300 were probably not what, what we would want or expect today. And I've heard people say 30 years ago, a, a, an original mountain cur would barely stay treed, you know, and I believe that I, I'm sure that that's, there's some truth to that, but the breed as it stands today offers uh, I mean, some whale of tree dogs. My little Ben dog that I had was was a whale of a tree dog. The bud dog I've got is 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 all the tree dog you'd ever want. I mean, they just don't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's there's uh, different style of tree dogs, Chris. There's the dogs that that are under the squirrel, standing back off the tree and you just about got to get behind him and look between his ears and wherever he's looking, <laughs> you're going to see the squirrel. Yeah. There's the dogs that, uh, are wind in style dogs that can pick them out of trees. Uh, like a layup coon dog. There's dogs that, uh, are really keen on their ears and their eyes. Uh, much like a feist would be, uh, right. I like a dog that's sort of balanced. I want them using their nose primarily. Um, I think their ears and their eyes get them in trouble. I don't even want them looking, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so uh, here's, you talk about competition. Here's an, here's something that'll baffle the listeners, and 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 probably the vast majority of squirrel hunters will disagree with me. Okay, 
I will shock a dog that tries to timber a squirrel. (laughs) I will not tolerate a dog leaving a tree for any reason, even if the squirrel's leaving. And I've, I've set them up. Uh, I have literally shocked them back to the tree if they try to timber because if, if for the sole purpose of I am a competition hunter first, and when that dog's sitting in there 300 over the hill and he timbers a squirrel, you're getting minus. Even and if, I don't want no if, minus points. Even if you see the timbering squirrel, because, I mean, it's been no, years. No, 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 no. No, if you see the squirrel, that's a different story. Yeah. But the vast majority of the time, you don't see the squirrel. He's just in the country moving, and guess what? Minus that dog, he's moving. Right. You know, that's how it works. But a squirrel timbers naturally. A lot of times, squirrels timber naturally. So wouldn't you be taking the natural ability of the dog out? Uh, To a degree, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There's you say it without any really apology. Good at staying under a squirrel, they 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 timber them like a cat. Yeah. And if if I've got a dog that's probably that good, I probably wouldn't mess with them. But when I've got a hard tree dog that only does it once in a while, or or you know, isn't very good. I've, I'm, Bud is horrible at timbering a squirrel. He sees him go, and he just drops his head, and he runs out there about 60 yards in that direction, and he just falls treed wherever he thinks it might have stopped. And he never, he's never right, you know? <laughs> well, there you go. So okay, I so... I stop it. All right. So I think you could tie it over to... and tie it into a, a dog that... You know, like gun dogs, a dog that breaks flush, you know, or breaks point to flush Absolutely. a bird. So... Absolutely. I know, yeah. I I I can I can kind of see where you're going. <laughs> yeah, I would take my young dog Ben uh, in the spring, you know, in in the winter time, and if I see that he's got the the itch to start timbering, I'll leave him run loose with my my finger on the button, so to speak, and I'll bark the squirrel. In other words, shoot next to him and make him timber. And when I see that young dog's feet come off that tree, <laughs> I lay some juice to him and make him get back. And he knows what I'm doing. And he gets it. And he's good for a while, you know. I don't care if you stand there and watch him leave. Uh, and and quite frankly, a lot of times they just go one or two trees over and they sit tight. And they're still within the search area where they can be plussed. But... If the dog goes with them and the cast notices, hey, he was treated here and now he's over there, I'm sorry, you, you just took minus. So there's a there's a whole aspect of competition hunting that doesn't appeal to a meat hunter, okay? And I get it. That's just what I do. Yeah. But I've lost hunts because the dog's over the hill. You can't see nothing. All you know is there's, they squeal. As the squirrel bails, they see it, and off they go. And the next thing you know, they're 120 yards treed over there, and you just took a minus. And and most generally, I found, when you do get to that tree, it's got a hole in it. Because that squirrel knew where he wanted to be. Right. And you're not recovering any points. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let me, let me, so, tell, you, let me tell you a funny story. So, a buddy and I traveled down we used to travel down to south georgia every year to hunt when they had the uh, the southern heritage hunt down in albany georgia and yep my buddy ronnie roland he had to work one day and he's like hey i got you guys set up with a guy that's that's going to take you hunting and uh so we drive back we drive <laughs> we drive back into this plantation Okay, this guy had some great hunting, but we drive back into this plantation. We met him about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When you're on the road and stuff, you, you you can only sit around the camper or whatever for so long. And then, I mean, you came to hunt, so you're going hunting. So we met this guy about mm-hmm. 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We drive back this lane of this plantation, beautiful place. And you remember uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom? 
You remember yep, that show? I sure do. Marty remember, Stolfer? Yep, but remember Big Jim, the guy that really did all the work for Marty? The guy that was always on the road. I do. Yeah, Big Jim was the one that was always on the end of the line, you know, wrestling the alligators and, and all that stuff. Well, Jim had a – Big Jim had a, a plantation down there. So we're driving back through here, and I'm not kidding you. It looked like an African safari. We had kudus <laughs> and gazelle in these high fence areas, and you drive by this big water hole, and there was a hippopotamus pond. And all kinds of wow. crazy stuff. And we just keep driving back through here. And this this plantation was huge. It went back down into a river bottom. Well, anyway, you know, Andy and I are packing these big, high-powered, grand squirrel champion, OMCBA, blah, 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 squirrel dogs. And we hunt back in there <laughs> for, for four hours. And I think we scratched out like half a dozen squirrels. Huh. And the guy that went with us had, had a little feist he didn't even get him out of the truck until an hour before dark and the little dog's name was scoop he called him scoop he turned scoop loose and scoop treats 17 squirrels in an hour <laughs> and i'm looking at my dog well, that i hauled 12 hours south to compete <laughs> in this big squirrel hunt and scoop the little no-name feist that was sitting in his little kennel crate in the back of a chevette jumps out and, and just puts it all over us. I mean, it was... Let it, me ask you a it question. It was hilarious. Did you put your dogs up when he got Scoop out? Yes, sir. We put Scoop... Okay. We put ours up. I, ours I, wore I've out. been in your scenario, and I know what happened. The squirrels weren't moving midday. You and got right it. before dark, them little southern gray squirrels are crawling everywhere. But little Scoop put on a show, man. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I like Scoop. I just like the the I like the the story and the sounds of the little dog. He's he's he my kind cool. of dog. But I'm telling you, I've been all over the the country, and them southern grays are fickle. Aren't and a they? lot of times, yes. Oh my gosh, and they move right before dark a yep. lot. Yep. Yeah, I think the so, guy had a plan I, the whole time. He's like, "No, I'll just leave Scoop." I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to take the sting out of it for yeah. you. <laughs> I think I'll just leave Scoop in there for a little bit. You guys go ahead and hunt. He's like, "You guys don't reverse mind. the roles." Yeah. I think uh, had Scoop had the two o'clock round, you guys would have fared a lot better. We come dragging, in the evening with your dog. <laughs> yeah, we come dragging out of the bo bottoms. We're wore out. We're you know, it's like wow, you know, that's a long hunt. We walked like seven miles and. <laughs> And he's like, "Hey, you guys, let, you guys care if I let Scoop out for a little bit? You know, he's been in this box all day. <laughs> yeah, man, go ahead, let uh, him." And then it was on, and it, that yeah. was a complete setup. No and the doubt beauty of squirrel hunting is you forgot you were tired. Oh yeah, yeah. It you, it was game on, and you're having the time of your life, no matter whose dog it is. That's my point. The squirrel dog is a beautiful animal. And it's a great sport. I'm having the time of my life. I'm meeting the best people in the world. And that just like that story there, I've got a handful of my own, you know, that are for another day. But what a great crowd, you yeah. know, and what a great sport. It really is a great sport. I've got so. I've got such wonderful experiences, memories. My kids, you know, Stacy. Osborne used to come up every year and hunt with us. I've got I've got pictures of my kids when they were huh. <laughs> five and six, maybe seven years old, my daughter and my son, just enjoying the day. And when Stacy would come to town, it was we Yeah. It was a vacation for them, you know. They were in Boy, the bunk bunkhouse he, in the evenings and Jake would be out there eating Vienna sausage learning how to eat Vienna sausages and and <laughs> you know, I mean just it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. And I know we got kind of Stacey's hard on good people. Oh yeah. Yep. Um uh, I know we got down on, you know, maybe some of the ugly parts of it, but that's not to overshadow the the treasures that are in having our families involved in this this sort of this lifestyle that we live absolutely and anybody anybody in the hound world in the bird dog world in any kind of hunting 
dog world that goes to Jamestown, Tennessee and walks in on the grounds realizes there's something special there. The hot, the, the clubhouse is immaculate. The atmosphere is, is, uh, magical. It's uh, a great place to be. There's great food, great people. And as an overall overview, I love the breed and the organization still, even though I see some of the, uh, the stuff that I don't necessarily agree with. Okay. It's because we love, it's because we love it so much. We we love what it stands for and we want to, we want to protect it. We want to improve it. We want to, we want it to be the greatest it can be. Uh, yeah. You know, when I was in the OMCBA, it was it was like, man, I don't need hounds. I I've got what right. I need right here, and if I don't have yep. what I need right here, then I need to, you know, I don't need that outside influence. The dog that I'm hunting is great enough to do great things, and yeah. you know, uh, on that note, Chris, uh, uh, an original mountain cur is not just a dog that trees squirrels. But it's a dog that will sufficiently treat coons, and it's also a dog that will lay on your couch and lick your children in the face. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an amazing animal, and uh, I, I really cherish the breed. I'm very careful um, who I sell my puppies to with that in mind because a lot of the hound heads, so to speak, um, I call them hound heads. I, I am one, uh, I are you know, one. the heavy handed, uh, beat their brains out and, uh, make them do right type guys. Uh, they'll ruin a few curves before they get it right with, with that mentality. And, um, you, I tell people that don't, you know, know the breed or haven't been around them. If you treat, if you treat this puppy like a, like a cocker spaniel, uh, and, and just take it to the woods and, and don't get rough with it until it's a little older and you got to make some corrections. But treat it like a cocker spaniel or a bird dog. You'll do just fine because they're smart, sometimes smarter than me. I you always know. treated them like border collies. There you go. You know, Better I work. I did. I did. I treated, we had border collies. And, and going back to that thing that we t- talked about competition versus pleasure dog. I always looked at it like this. If you take a border collie and we, we've all seen those great videos of these well-trained border collies doing their job and border collies need a job. You know, they send them on a line. They, they cast them left. They cast them right. They herd the sheep. They herd the cattle. They bring them up. They sort them. They put them, you know, it's all on voice command, whistle command, blah, blah, blah. You know, we all sit back and we look at that and we're like, wow, look at that. We're in awe. Absolute but awe. if you put no training in that border collie at all, you'll have a common dog that needs a job. Yep. And our cur, those yeah. cur dogs are the exact same way. You can take great almost point. any cur dog and you can have a great buddy dog that's going to root out the snake from under the rock and bay possums and but you can also take that same dog and hone his skills to be a lethal tree squirrel tree and machine they're that smart yeah and that's where uh, i kind of shine i guess you'd say and I, i'm not on here to toot my own horn but i'm very fortunate in that i have the the type of job where I work for myself and I, I, I'm a service technician. I go around the state of Michigan, fixing people's windows and their doors. And when hunting season rolls on, um, I got a dog in the box. Yeah. Because it's that constant hunting and training and repetition that makes them better. And when I can take a dog and hunt it five days a week or six days a week in preparation for a hunt and really not even upset the apple cart, because I'm, you know, I might drive to an hour and a half away and fix somebody's window or their door. And then I've got a three hour window before my next appointment. Well, guess what? <laughs> I hit a piece of state land wherever I'm at. Oh man. And I might hunt for two and a half or three hours and, and then go do another job on the way home. I'll, now I'll, that's rare. Okay. Yep. 
Yeah, but it's, t- it's, I did the same thing, Adam. The best thing that ever you? the best thing that ever happened to my squirrel dogs is I was also a canine handler, so I already had a dog box in the truck with me. So Perfect. as a conservation officer, I'm a canine handler, so I got the, I got the rig to haul dogs. <laughs> So, so you would, it was, would not be uncommon for you to pull up and me roll the window down on my, on my state unit and my, my working dog and a mountain cur would stick its head out of the, out of the window and look at you. (laughs) So, so I would go to the fish and wildlife areas or whatever and do a foot patrol. I didn't keep the dog in the box. The dog came with me and. Yeah, and, and we would tree squirrels, and if I got a call, I'd call him in. We'd beat feet back to the truck, and away we'd go. I was supposed to be there anyway, so yeah. bang, there you go. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Well, you know, I've had a lot of success. I've I've uh, done a lot of winning, and I don't um, lay claim to the line of dogs. They were all established before I got into them. Um, I've had some great success in, in breeding, but the success that I've enjoyed, um, in the competition hunts, I can, I attribute to, um, my job and my ability to, to hunt one every day, you know, and, um, that's, that's a beautiful thing for me. Um, if that were to end tomorrow, I would say my, my success in the competition world might end with it. You know, um, guys that are serious about winning don't necessarily need to add hound or whatever they deem they need to add. They need to hunt a dog proper and train it proper and, and do it right. And then they'll enjoy the winning that they desire. That that's, that's the fact of it. We've already got what we need. Interesting. It's interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It just <laughs> it just put a lot of thoughts screaming through my my pea brain here. Um, yeah, but I I don't disagree with you at all on on that. Yeah, that's that's kind of yeah. what my mantra was. But at the same time, we're always breeding for something better. You know, we always well the and, next cross is oh, going to yeah. be better. Of course. Yep. yep. That's human nature. Sure. That's that's. Uh, that's all part of it. It's, it's true for every aspect of hunting dogs in the world, bird dogs, coon dogs. Um, but at the (laughs) end of the day, you get out of them what you put into them. And that's even true for raising your own children. You know, um, if you want something special, put, let them be special, put that time into them. What I'm you hearing, know, you, what I'm hearing you saying, Adam, is is there's there's no shortcut for hard work, and that's what separates good dogs from great dogs is the the yeah. amount of work that you put into them. And I can think Absolutely. of a couple of things. You know, m- my buddy Mike Colley down in Louisiana, he'll have people show up and and trying to pick out their pups or whatever, and and they'll the, a lot of them will ask, which one do you think is going to be the best dog? And he always tells them the same answer. The one that you hunt the most is that's gonna, right. The one that you hunt the most. Is I used be the, to, I, I used to, I mentioned earlier about my little fling with the beagles and I will tell you, and I still believe it today. The best beagle I ever had was when I only had one and he got all my attention, you know, agreed. that's true for, everything i mean you mentioned the the border collies doing amazing things that didn't just happen somebody really put some some elbow grease into training them dogs i've always i've always wondered adam you know it's like we we still even in 2021 even the best of us i'm guilty of it myself you know we treat these dogs like oh that's my hunting dog so I'm not hunting, so I'm not taking it with me right now. Whereas if you take that border collie and you go to Montana, that dog's in that truck all day long. He's in the house Mm -hmm. with him at night and I can see it with my wife and we've got a boxer here that we, I call her Roxy, Roxy, the wonder dog. She's a rig dog. I mean, she's an amazing dog, but she's with me 
probably 12 hours a day at least. And when we go, yeah. when we go coon hunting at night, you know, she'll go out for a little bit. She'll come back. But as soon as she hears those dogs treed, I won't see her again until I get to that tree and she'll be <laughs> at that tree. She, I've never got her to tree. I'm not going to say oh, that, wow. but she'll yeah. carry coons out of the woods, but she's a part of it. And I always catch myself and kick myself in the butt thinking, man, put that pup in the truck with you. So what? It's a backseat of a truck or whatever. Yeah. Well, let me interject something right there, Chris, because you, you, you touched on something that many of our viewers will be able to relate to. And, and I think that we can maybe help them at this intersection of the podcast. Uh, I used to have, and we mentioned her earlier, a plot female named Buckeye Annie. Mm -hmm. And that dog did not travel well. And several of the hounds that I had over the years, uh, I learned that if I wanted to go out of state and do any good, I better go a day early, find somebody to hunt with, knock the travel off, as I call it. And they'd usually look pretty good the next night. Mm -hmm. Now, with my current situation, I found that these dogs get um, used to being in the box and being hauled around and being um, in the truck. And we do a disservice to them when we don't do more than just take them to the woods via the dog box up the road and around the block and in our neighborhood. Right. And then we throw them in the truck and drive six hours and expect them to perform that that doesn't really add up sometimes with some of these strains. So I've just stumbled onto the fact that if you can haul them often and for distances, um, you're doing them a favor. Mm -hmm. I put young dogs in the box. Sometimes I come home from hunting. I don't ever take them out of the box. I leave them sleep in the box overnight because that's what's going to happen when I go to Jamestown, Tennessee or anywhere, anywhere else. And by hauling them every day, sometimes they're in the box for two and a half hours before we reach a piece of state land that we can turn them loose. And it might only be for one or two trees. And then they're in the box for two and a half hours or three hours on the way home. And I might hunt a little bit more. I have found that conditioning these dogs to actually handle the bumpy road for hours and hours, day in and day out, now when I go to Jamestown, Tennessee, and I wind down through the mountains and the hills and I make myself car sick, I pull a dog out of the box that's wound up and ready to go, and he ain't car sick at all because he's used to it. Yeah, yeah. I, and think guys about would really do themselves a favor by finding some form of a regiment of travel. Um, I tell people, haul them young and haul them often. If you're going up town for a gallon of milk, throw the puppy in the box. You exactly. know, get him over the puking and, and the car sickness. Um, it, it just It's just a valid point, you know, that we kind of got into there. But yeah, part I, of what I do. I had, a, I had a guy, a person, ask me. It wasn't a guy. I can't remember. It was a person. We'll just say that. But uh, ask mm -hmm. me how long. Because... It's not unusual for me to take off. Like last winter, I took off, and I actually spent uh, two and a half months on the road working in Kalispell and different places. And uh, I've taken month-long trips hauling hounds and hunting different states and stuff. And it's like, you know, how often do you stop? Well, I stop. Mm -hmm. I stop. How often do you stop and let the dogs out? Well, I stop when it depends on weather it depends on a lot of things but it's not unusual for me to leave a dog in a box for eight to ten hours straight because if i'm if i'm going across kansas and there isn't a whole lot of reason for me to stop going across kansas except splash yeah. and go and uh but i always look at it like this if we tried to get in a covered wagon right now and ride the oregon trail from st louis missouri to oregon <laughs> we couldn't take it dude I'm telling That's you. That's right. But That's those right. people did it because they were used to it. And we always put, we try to shy away from putting human feelings to, um, you know, our dogs. But it's the same concept. You know, it's what it you totally are used is. to. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've I've uh, come to realize that you know if you do the work at home, you don't necessarily need to go down a day early because they're used to it already. And 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 riding in that dog box is not like sitting up front in the cab. It just isn't. You know, it's a bumpy ride, pad or no pad. It's a bumpy ride, and um, you know you you might be able to sleep in the back seat, but I I don't think the dogs sleep real well. And, um, I'll tell you, you what, know, I, I'll tell you what I found, Adam, was after they, they get used to doing that, like I'd be in New Mexico and think, man, I need to get the dogs out. And I'd open the dog box and nobody would meet me at the gate. I'd be looking up <laughs> in there and they'd be, they'd be sprawled out and, and curled up and sleeping. And yeah. it's like, what, you know, and you get, and you get them out and they come out and they stretch and you time to the fence. It's like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll go to the bathroom and I'll drink some water, but right. I'm ready to go back in the box. Let's roll, dude. I'm ready to roll. Yep. Yep. They're in the barrier. Well, there's a, there's a routine that we can get used to and get them used to. And we're better. We're, you know, they're better for it. And we are too, at the end of the day, when, when everybody's just kind of used to what's going to happen, you know, you got it. You got it. So. Well, man, we have had one whale of a conversation. I'm telling you, this has been great. Have you got any final thoughts that you want? We probably ought to cut this off and save some for the next episode, Adam. Sure. uh, Uh, My final thought, I want to put a plug in to Jimmy Inman and the uh, National Sporting Dog. Um, They've done a great job with uh, picking up where where, uh, they've really – generated a, 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 a registry that uh, is is focused on integrity and honest papers um, they're registering uh, mountain curves now with with um, you know DNA every, every everything's DNA <clears throat> and um, I think that registry was probably started out of frustration but it's okay they've uh, they've not really tried to compete. So much as offer uh, guys like myself what we're looking for, you know. Yeah. And um, anybody that is serious about squirrel hunting, I highly recommend that you look up the National Sporting Dog uh, website and look at their schedule of events and show up at one and go spectate on a cast and watch a uh, a 90-minute competition cast with your own eyes and walk into them trees and you'll be surprised what them squirrel dogs can do, you know, but uh, it's a good time. It's, it's a clean, uh, atmosphere. And, uh, we, we really appreciate the support that everyone has shown. And, uh, just wanted to, uh, put a, put a plug out there for, for Jimmy and the great job he's doing. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, uh, so and I, that's how, that's how you get started. Even if you're thinking about getting a squirrel dog, if you do, if you've never had any experience with squirrel dogs, go look. You know, go attend a, an yeah. event. You know that there's definitely going to be there, and um, yeah, you don't know until you go and and well. See and for I yourself. will say too, uh, OMCBA is um, we've got some good board members that are serious about integrity, and we are trying to keep the the train on the tracks. We're trying to make some changes, even though the voters voted down DNA. Um, we're looking at some other things that we'll try to write the ship. I don't believe it's too late. People have said it's too late. There's too much, uh, false blood out there. Well, there is, but if we keep what we have today, pure, that hound influence will disappear, you know? And uh, we just got to start somewhere. So we're trying. We are trying. I'm not giving up just yet. Right. Right. Well, Adam, I appreciate your time. Taking time appreciate out of your schedule. You, buddy. Talk about talk about squirrel dogs and, and squirrel hunting. And uh, we'll, I'll, I'll ask you off air what part of, your, part of Michigan you're from. But uh, so, hey, can't thank you enough. Yeah, man. Anybody ever wants to come up and hunt with uh, with me, I'm I'm always open to to show people the ropes. And uh, I live in Southern Michigan. I hunt a lot in Northern Michigan, but uh, I'm all over the country. And if you ever bump into me, make sure you say hi. 
You bet, Adam. Till next time, buddy. You follow your hounds, and I'll follow mine.